Down don't bother me. Yeah. 
I've got plenty of nothing, and nothing is plenty for me. The fact is, so many people, regardless of the circumstances they live in, find themselves sometime during their journey in life depressed. Yeah. The truth is, there's somebody in this room today well. that came here with a heavy spirit. Yeah. Yeah. And if you had time to tell your story, you tell us that circumstances have driven you to the wall of despair. The weeds of sorrow have grown all over your body. The lines of grief have been plowed into your face. And you can barely live with the anguish that's going on inside of you. It may be death or disease. We've been visited by that just as we did. It may be doubt or discouragement. It may be disappointment or even divorce. But there's somebody here today who's had to deal with the burden of being uh, in a continued state of depression. You try drugs and alcohol. You try to escape the reality of your pain only to find yourself on the miracle round of the emotional imbalance. All right. And when the ride is over, once the ride is done, you find yourself right back at the place where you start. In the clutches of the very thing that had you depressed in the first place. And, and, and you're being so gripped tightly by depression that it appears that depression is acting like an insecure child clinging to you. In this particular instance, perhaps you don't have depression, but depression has you. Adults are depressed. Teens are depressed. Children are depressed. Babies are depressed. Someone has said that depression is like war. You either win or you die trying. The other writer said depression is nourished by a lifetime of ungrieved and unforgiven hurts. In other words, some of our depression is self-imposed. And as a result, we suffer from what I call self-inflicted wounds. So no wonder Psalm says, I'm worn out from sobbing. All night I flood my bed with weeping, drenching it with tears. No wonder the psalmist said, for my life is spent with grief, and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity. No wonder the psalmist says, oh Lord, how long will you forget me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forever? Yeah. All right. How long will you look the other way? How long? how long must I struggle with anguish in my soul and sorrow in my heart every day? Moses asked God to take his life. Job asked God to kill him. Yep. Elijah wanted God to slay him. And Jonah asked God to do away with him. Well, and there are many today who are taking their own life because of depression. Yeah. Depression is an ancient and contemporary spirit. Yeah. We're all depressed at times. We all get down in the dumps every once in a while. Yeah. There may be times when we feel that God has forgotten us and that we'll never be able to get back on track again. Well, we often wonder why it's happening, especially if we're Christians. We, we identify with Irma Bombeck, who asked uh, a question in the, the title of one of her best-selling books, if life is a bowl of cherries, why am I living in the pits? <laughs> Both Psalm 42 and 43 are books about depression. And since most of us are cast down at one time or another, we naturally turn to a song that honestly and forthrightly asks us, why are we cast down? Yeah. And then we encourage when it answers in a hopeful manner and says, put your hope in God. Yes, For I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. That's right. That's right. The words, I will yet praise him, are words that mean that my present downcast mood right. is not the final act of my life's journey. Right. So with reference to our text this morning, there, there's some debate as to who in fact penned this particular song. Okay. 
Some have suggested it was David when he was fleeing from the report of his son Absalom. Others have suggested it was King Hezekiah. Jerusalem was under attack from the Assyrians. He experienced much easiness, uneasiness and discomfort during his time of rule at a certain particular time, especially when Sennacherib was given him the blue. Yeah. Regardless yeah. or not, either of these authors are true. It was seen that the author of this psalm is going through a time of distress, personal attack, and internal turmoil. His life brought him face to face with circumstances that were completely out of his control. Pain and confusion made their way to his heart and took up residence by settling in for a season. You know, if you're here today, you haven't had turmoil and pain and personal attacks, just keep on living. Yeah. Life has a way of bringing you to the neighborhood of Psalm 43 and then dropping you off and telling you you're on your own. The fact is, we all have faced in our times uh, various types of turmoil and pain and heartache that life brings. These times tend to be the time that define where we stand as believers. As we read these psalms, it becomes quickly evident that the psalmist is a broken man. <coughs> Yet through brokenness, he's still able to bring to cling to his faith in God. Just like a man thrown overboard in the ocean clings to uh, a life preserver. The psalmist cries out for deliverance from his troubles. And today we want to examine both the depth of his pain and the height of his faith to the Lord. All right. So here in verses 1 through 3, uh, we see his cry. From the outset of this psalm, we're introduced to a man who is in touch with the Lord of heaven. If there were ever reason to rejoice in difficulty, it lies in the fact that we have access to God. Yeah. And in him, we find all the help we need to weather the storms of life. The psalmist feels trapped by his circumstances as he cries out to God. But notice what he wanted deliverance from. He says he wanted deliverance from the slander of men. Well, Evidently he'd been attacked by yeah, others and feels yeah. he'd been hurt by the words and actions of others. Yeah. He pleads for God to get involved and to vindicate him before his enemies. Yeah. Now all of us have had wrong done to us on one time or another. Amen. When that happens we are to leave all judgment in the matter up to the Lord That's and right. refuse to seek vengeance. Yeah. In this life, people are going to slander you. Yeah. People are going to scandalize your name. Yeah. But we're instructed in the fourth chapter of Ephesians to be kind to one another, yes. tenderhearted, yes. forgiving one another, That's even right. as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Yes, sir. Yes. It's also wanted to be deliverance from, delivered from the silence of God. Oftentimes, when the trouble of life comes, it seems that God is totally unconcerned about your situation. We pray and nothing happens. We cry out to him and there appears to be no response. Uh, we suffer and still the pain remains. The psalmist wants the Lord to speak to him about the situation, but the Lord remains silent. He feels that God has cast him away. And in our lives, we feel like the psalmist did, we need to remember that he operates in ways that we cannot comprehend. Isaiah 55 said his ways are not. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Yes. And the heavens are higher than earth. Yes. Even so, his ways are higher than our ways. Yes. And his thoughts yes. than our thoughts. Yes. And since he is an eternal God, his yes. timetable is totally different than ours. Yes. And though it might seem like he doesn't care, he knows all about your situation and will act when the time is right, if he so chooses. Yes. Sometimes in life we act like Abraham and Sarah trying to help God out. Well, we want to do what we think ought to be done. And what we do most time is not even on God's agenda. As we say from that in time to time, we want God to bless what we do, but we don't want to do what God bless. Yeah. Yeah. Silence in the light does not mean that he doesn't care. It may mean he has something greater and more glorious waiting for you. But you'll have to go through the process that he has planned in order for you to get what he has for you to do. And most of us just don't like the processes of life. Sometimes the process is job related. 
Sometimes the process includes family issues with our spouses or children. Sometimes the process just may include a willing, willingness on your part okay. to cut the emotional umbilical cord right. from all that is dear to you so yeah. that your focus can be on what God has for you yes. instead of you trying to keep what may not necessarily be for you. Yeah. You fail to see it's for your benefit, not knowing it's to your detriment. A few years back, a little while ago, I told you about the dog that stole the slab of meat <laughs> off a hot barbecue. <laughs> now, this is for those who didn't hear a few minutes ago. Dog took off running and hollered. For the ribs were in his mouth, burning his mouth, teeth, and tongue. But now, when he gets to where he's going, he'll set the ribs down. But he's not able to enjoy them. Because he got to deal with third degree burns in his mouth and on his tongue. And this dog teaches us that, that, that you can't go on and hold on to sin and not get burned. And then when you get where you're going, you find out you can't enjoy it like you thought you could. You start asking yourself, what in the world was I thinking? If you would have just sat there and looked at the owner with a little sad face, he might have broke you off a bone or two. <laughs> That movie, he said, just one rib. Can I get just one rib? <laughs> and, and, and how many of us have tried to run off with an unauthorized possession? Right. Something that God did not give us, but we picked it up off of some hot grill from a club or bar. I submit to us, if we be honest, we've discovered that all sin will do with you is burn you. Come on, God. Sin will leave evidence all around to expose Everywhere. your word. And, and it's fitting because if you stay in sin and then die in sin, then you burn in hell for yeah. because you refuse to let loose of your sin yeah. and grab a hold of Christ's salvation. Yeah. And the worst part about sin is sin can cause God to go silent on you. Mm. But if you want God to move from silence to speaking, then you need to put yourself in a position that you're able to submit yourself to hear what he has to say when he does speak. Okay. But then the psalmist not only wants to be delivered from the slander of men, not only does he want to deliver us from the silence of God, but he also wants deliverance from the sorrow of heart. Oh. And in this case, he desired deliverance from the sorrow of his own heart. Perhaps he had a question like some of us may be asking today. Why am I letting the actions of a few godless people control my life? That, that's a good question. When we reach a place where our troubles and negative people and circumstances of life control our joy and still our peace, we need to ask ourselves the same question. And the truth of the matter is, the joy that we have was not given to us by the word. And the joy we have cannot be removed by the word. Somebody said the world didn't give it. The world gave it. Take it away. But I'm encouraged by this psalmist because he knew where his strength originated. In verse 2, he calls on God because his circumstances were beyond his control. He says, For you are my God. Mm -hmm. The psalmist realized that there are situations that he does not have the ability to fix. Therefore, he calls on the name of the Lord, knowing that God alone has to, the power to fix whatever is broken in his life. And we need to understand that we don't have the spiritual mechanical fortitude to deal with the brokenness in our spirit. That they don't need in us, uh, uh, there's no need in us allowing it to control our life. Yeah. We don't have the divine capacity to handle the broken stuff. All we can do is bring it to God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. When we do so, and stand yeah. in His strength, yeah. we can watch Him work it out in our behalf. Yeah. In verse 3, He desires to be led by truth. So He asks the Lord to lead Him out of where he is and take him where he should be. And that's a prayer worthy of all of us today. Yes, sir. He, he wants to hear the word of God telling him what to do. And when we need direction and leadership in our lives, we need to look no further than the Bible. Yes. It is a book that holds solutions to all of life's rivers. Yes. We go wrong when we reject the clear teaching of the word of God. Yes. He wants to follow God's plan in every place in his life. How many of us today see the 
teaching of the Word of God and see the path that He wants us to walk in and yet refuse to walk in His way. When we seek to follow His Word and His way, we can expect Him to lead us from the place of trouble to the realms of peace. Psalm 119, 11 says, Thy word have I hid in thy heart, that I might not sin against thee. The psalmist has a healthy desire for the word of God, but he also desires to worship God. He longs to be in the place where he can worship the Lord. He wants to be in a place of blessings. But now sometimes it's hard to worship when there's trouble in your heart. It's hard to express joy when you're crushed by the burdens that life brings. But if you're seeking God's way through his word, when you walk in it, he'll lead you to worship again. In Psalm 73, Asaph walked through a valley of despair until he looked at the things from God's perspective. Asaph got caught up in the prosperity of the wicked, and his feet almost slipped. But then he went to church. He went into the sanctuary and gained an understanding of the end of the wicked. This understanding came as he found himself at the place of worship. Yes, sir. So we got the psalmist cry. But secondly, we see his commitment. He offers uh, sacrifices. He, he vows to make his way to the altar. But he says, I will go. But he doesn't refer to anything, taking anything with him. Perhaps he's promising to do what the Lord wants all of us to do, and that is to offer ourselves to him yes, sir. as a living sacrifice. Yes, sir. We should determine now that we'll call upon him even in the midst of our trials. That's right. And that we'll place all we have on the altar for his glory. Right. He also promises to offer songs. He vows to use his abilities to praise the name of the Lord. Yeah. We live in a time where praise has just about gone out of style. Mm -hmm. Perhaps people are either too ashamed of the Lord, too bashful, too stubborn, too sinful. Yeah. Too prideful to praise the Lord. We may not have a lot of talent. We may not have a lot of ability. On, but there's one thing we can do. We can open our mouths. Yeah. 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 We're to praise Him for who He is. That's right. Praise Him for what He's done. Yeah. And praise Him for what He will do. Yeah. Praise is not a time of complaints or fast judgment on others. It's a time to give glory to God. One thing that can put a damper on an otherwise meaningful worship experience is a negative spirit when the children of God are in praise. God's people ought to praise. And one writer says, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out of me. You do know he did some saving work one day. But that's reason to praise him. He, he woke you up this morning. That's reason to praise him. He started you on your way. That's reason to praise him. He gave you the rightness of your mind. That's reason to praise him. And he's keeping all of us right now. That's reason to praise him. You see this problem. See this commitment, and finally, we want to look at his confidence. Uh -huh. The psalmist expresses his confidence when he asks his soul a question in verse 5. In essence, why? he's saying, why? Since God is in control of this thing, yeah. then why are you upset? Yeah. Then he tells his soul the only prescription it needs for, the, for joy in the valleys of life is hope in God. We want to ask our soul the same question today. Okay. Instead of allowing hopelessness and despair, to weigh us down. We ought to turn to heaven to help us with our sense of hopelessness. Instead of letting worry sap our strength, ruin our nights and shorten our lives, we can yes. take God's prescription. We just need a good dose of hope. Oh, yes. Philippians said, be anxious for nothing, Amen. but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Amen. The peace of God, that's an all understanding shall Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Right. And even though the psalmist is in a dark valley, he knows he'll soon come out of that valley with victory. He knows it's because of his faith in God. He knows that no matter how bad it looks right now, that the Lord is going to bring him through to the other side. Yeah. Yeah. Remember the disciples in the boat? They thought they were doomed in the storm. 
But in their terror, they forgot that what Jesus told them before they boarded the boat, Jesus said, let's pass over to the other side. One phrase that makes all the difference in their situation. They weren't doomed to die in the storm. They just need to learn to lean on the Lord by faith. Yeah. So no matter what you're facing, it's not going to last forever. That's right. Mom used to tell us all the time, this too will pass. Yeah. Eventually you reach the end of that valley. One day as the children of God, we'll spend eternity in a place where trials of life will never find us again. Yeah. Yes. But until then, we're going to face trials. Yes, sir. Yeah. Until then, we're going to face battle. Yeah. Yeah. But remember, they don't come to stay. They just come to pass. Yeah. And, and yes, it's okay to, to face whatever it is that's bothering you. If your soul is cast down, uh, bring it out and call it by name as you pray to God to help you. Okay. Okay. If someone in this room today, your soul is down because your child is weak. Bless, weak. Bless, bless. Someone is down because you have rent or mortgage payments due. Yeah. Someone is down because you're in a toxic relationship mm. that you refuse to let go. Someone is down because they've been passed over for promotion. Yeah. Or they may have an unsaved loved one. Yeah, but when we have hope in God, oh, we know he'll work things out for yeah. our good. Yeah. We then have the kind of hope that God will move to change even our countenance. Some of us have been proven tired, worn out, and stressed. God has a way of giving us a facelift free of charge because he'll restore the health of your yes. Just before his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus struggled with a heavy heart. Yeah, yeah. He took Peter, James, and John began uh, to be greatly distressed and troubled. He told him his soul was very sorrow, mm -hmm. even to the point of death. Yeah. Look at Jesus well, being torn between the Father and himself. Yeah. Whether in his humanity to throw his hands up and back away, or whether to endure the cross as the prophets of old had written about him. The full weight of sin was down on him. Yeah. And with that full weight, he saw all the horrors of those who would choose to live a godless eternity. He saw unbelievers squirming in hell's unquenchable fire. Mm -hmm. He saw sinners who were too mean to repent. Yeah. And now they were hoping with no hope for one last chance to repent. Mm -hmm. He saw those who used hypocrites at church as an excuse not to come to church or to give their lives to him. He saw proud and arrogant men and women lost in the clutches of disgrace and shame. The sin of one man is heavy enough, but he's carrying the sin of the world. He realized in the garden how cruel sin was and what a horrible debt he had to pay in order to redeem the world from sin. He had to come to grips with the criminality of sin. Uh, oh, the criminality of sin is heavy. He, he knew his father's view toward sin and sinners, that he had agreed to die on the cross for man's sin. He recognized that the hour of death was near. And, and knowing that, he became sorrow. Because sin brings sorrow, grief, and heaviness. Sin brings shame, disgrace, agony, tragedy, and death. Yeah. Sin brings separation from God. Yes. Death held much terror for him as it does us. Yeah. As death got closer and closer to Jesus, he cried out, Father, if it be thy will, well. remove this bitter cup from me. Yes. Nevertheless, not my will, well. but thine well. be done. Yeah. It looked bad for Jesus well. while they yeah. whipped him all night long. Yeah. Yeah. I can just imagine the sight of him could cause one's heart to hurt. They stood on him and mocked him. Yeah. And then Friday came, that, that horrible day of death came. That Friday, uh, death finally ran him down. And the world thought it was all over. The world had seen Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They saw them die and figured it was all over. Yeah. They had attended David and Solomon's funeral and witnessed Isaiah being sawed in half with a wooden saw. Yeah. Uh, they had mental pictures of Paul being beheaded on Nero's chopping block. They figured it was all over for Jesus. Because death had won every match it had with man. From the beginning of time, death had an undefeated record. All wins and no losses. The world saw a heavy-hearted man 
carrying a cross up Calvary's mountain. This cross came man who was on record of raising the dead finally died on that cross himself. He stayed in the grave all night, Friday. Stayed in the grave all day, Saturday. And all night, Saturday night. But early Sunday morning, he was heavenly alive. He got up with all the power of the Now we can have peace, joy, and hope. And salvation. If your heart is hurting this morning, and you feel downtrodden, you can have a resurrection. If you're sad and in despair, you can look up and you can move up. You can have a resurrection. Lord Mason says it best when he says, my faith, look up to thee. O Lamb of God, Savior divine, now hear me while I pray. Take all of my sins away. Lord, let me from this day be holy thine. There is hope for hearts that are hurting. We can look up to the Lamb of Calvary. There is hope for hearts that are hurting. Because my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness.